the topic I counted, I, I titled it Count the Cost. Count the Cost. Please help us to be bringing brethren in. Thank you. Count the Cost. So, let's count the cost. So, before we go into our message, we have got five things that we should bring to the church of God. Our Bible, our notebook, pen, hymn book, and our offering. Then, Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 18, the one that gives us the mandate to minister. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, thou givest him not warning, nor speaketh to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But he said, his blood will I require from your hand. Praise the Lord. So it's very important. God is telling us, even if they die, they are, they are going to die, but I'm going to hold you accountable because he did not preach the truth. Follow me to the book of Luke, chapter 14, verse 27. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. Praise the Lord. Verse 28. For which of you intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counted the cost, whether he had sufficient to finish it. Or then he went, he went on to give another example again. Lest happily, after he had laid the foundation, is not able to finish, people will begin to mock him. Then he went again to about the king now. Or what king going to make war against another king seated not down and consulted whether they will be able with 10,000 to meet him that comment against him with 20,000. So basically, we're going to take our reading from 14, Luke chapter 14, verse 27. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Remember in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, he said, pick up your cross daily. It was a qualified statement. Daily and follow me. Now, he is making an expansion of what he told them again. Also, if I do not bear his cross and come after me, and not be my disciple. We are supposed to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of us, we become apostles, we become prophets before we can be disciples. When you call yourself a disciple, it means there's still a room to learn. Salvation is free, very free. But I'll tell you one thing, it is too costly to live out, to live that salvation, to, to live that faith that you prophesy. You cannot. What is the cost of following the Lord Jesus Christ? So the Luke chapter 14 that we read about, he said there were multitudes, people around, and he turned to them and he said, People were following him. He turned to them like this. He said, oh, say, if any man come to me and hates not his father and mother and wife and children and the brethren and sisters, yeah, and yet your own life, you cannot be my disciple. Then he went on to say, the, part, the 27 that we talked about, whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That's where they gave an example. If you want to build now, will you build a four-story house? It will, you will spend 25 years trying to build a, 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 a four-story house, 25 years. So you count, okay, if I make a house that has got one level, I'll be able to do it within two or three years, which is fairly reasonable anyway. So that, was, that is what you are saying you need to count the cost. He said the people will begin to laugh at you. This man that began to build was not able to finish. People were laughing at him now. He said, why would you start to go in and start, uh, start the building when you cannot complete? 
So within the call or within his call, calling, uh, he's calling to us to be his disciples. How do we descend the cost? How do we count the cost in each of our individual callings? How do we count the cost? Is it 20,000? When you say how much, cost is always with um, value attached to it. It will be monetary, whatever it is. So most significantly, how do we call, count the cost in advance when we do not know what cost will be accepted to us? I go to a tailor, I've got my trousers, it's too big. When I put it like this, it's, it's falling down. You say, just leave it here. Who will come and talk? I bought these trousers 20 euros. He said, no, no, it's okay, just go. When I come, they say my price to get these trousers done is 45 euros. He don't know. What are you going to do? You have already submit, you have already given in your, your cloth for alteration. Now we are in a cash 22 situation. We are saying, I bought it for 20. Now I am buying three trousers for 120. So how do you know the cost in advance? Because you don't know what's going to be at the end. So he says, be sure to count the cost before you sign up for discipleship with the Lord Jesus Christ, because it is. I encourage us brethren, especially those that are following us, do not rush to sign naively. Just give me our sign. It's not as easy as it is and be surprised later when the cost is very high. How does one count the cost when one does not know what's going to come in life? Look at uh, Mary, Mary the Virgin. If she had known what she was going to go through, she would have said, thank you, sir, thank you. Let me be. Apostle of God. All those great servants of God. If one of them had known what was going to, what was waiting for them on the other end, I don't think any would have accepted. If in Jeremiah said me, <laughs> I'm a small boy, oh, I'm a very small boy. He said, come, Moses. He said me, I cannot talk. Oh. When I talk, I stammer. God say, is it not me that make the deaf and the blind? They mute the dumb. Everybody that God truly called had an excuse because they knew these were not people who were naive. They knew, say, to walk with this man is not as easy as you think. In Genesis chapter 5, 24, 25, where it says, Enoch walked with God and he was no more. It was God. We had the same command again being given to Father Abraham. Genesis 17, verse 1, I think. He said, he said something very significant. Walk before me and be thou perfect. We are talking about Abraham. That God, the Father, said, this is my friend. We are talking about a friend of God here. That God said, this man is my friend. He is telling us, walk before me and be thou perfect. Look at Moses. God said the most humble man on all the earth. Every day God will take him. Come, spend some time. 40 nights was with God. Imagine with God showing God showing him all the things. How he created the world, how he did this. He never comes and me. I know, I know how God created the world. There are some people that dream today. They start telling everybody, I have dreamt, I have done this. These are signs of immaturity. These are signs of image. We are talking about the cost. How does one count the cost when one does not know what's coming in your life? How do I know? The answer is that the Lord Jesus Christ requires upfront a commitment to the highest possible cost. Whatever it takes. Remember the three Jewish boys, Daniel, uh, Mishik, and, uh, and um, Abednego. They were thrown into the fire. But before they were thrown, the king came and said, hey, young man, they said, sir, we will not be careful on this matter to answer you. 
we are going to talk anyhow. Can you have the microphones, please? Thank you. We are not going to answer. We are not going to be careful how we are going to answer. But if this our God decides that decides not to save us, then it's okay. The, the costs already, the costs they were ready to perish. They were ready to perish. So you begin to see they made a commitment upfront of the highest possible cost, which was their life, being thrown in a burning fire that within two hours they will be ashes. Ashes, bent to ashes. Nobody will recognize their ashes. That is the statement that made the Lord Jesus Christ come in person. He said, my children, because you have put faith in me, I will come down in person. He never sent an angel. He said, no, no, this is for me. Because you challenged the king, he said, I will not, we will not be careful how we are going to answer this matter. Because we have made up your, our mind, we have come to the post already. We know we are going to die. But if this God cannot save us from your end, then fine. This is, these are the costs. So this was a commitment to the highest possible God. Upfront, they didn't, they, didn't, they didn't know what was coming their way, but they just challenged the king and said, you know what? This one, I will not be careful. I will talk to you anyhow. And nothing later is going to surprise you because you have totally sold to the highest. Even if they kill me, it's, I don't care. We have seen ministers of God. There was one, I think was a Muslim, let me not call terrorist. <laughs> That is a demeaning term, but he went in a church. He said, everybody here, I want you to convert to Muslim. He said, me, I followed this one to church. I'm not even a Christian self. People started saying, it's pastor. Pastor said, me, I just tried to make money. This is how I, I make my living. I don't even know this Jesus self. Ah, okay. Say, good. So when you see people doing this thing, when it was done, he didn't know there were people who had pranked the pastor. He was pranked, and when he was pranked, he did not know that one of his um, senior church members, they wanted to see if something like that happens. Because they were putting on these uh, woods that were covering their faces. So when the pastor renounced the Lord Jesus Christ, said, ah, you are not fit to be the pastor of this church. Then step down. You cannot protect the people. If you believe in this same God that you are serving, you would have said, yes, I am a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even if you choose to fall, even if you, that statement that made the Lord Jesus Christ come, even if you choose to shoot me now, if the Lord allows it, let his will be done. I'll be going home anyway. When they point a gun to you like this, nothing happens. Because why? You have sold yourself to the most excessive cost that can ever be imposed. Very important indeed. So here, you are just saying, Lord, I'm all yours at any cost. What is required is your attitude. If any man come to me, let not his father, let not his mother. Don't come and say, hey, I hate you. This is not the kind of yet that's been talked about yet. I've seen servants, ministers of God neglecting their family. Always out, I'm going to the church, I'm doing this. The children are probably growing up as often. Yes, we are serving God, but this is also our first ministry. This is not the kind of love that the Lord talked about. So the cost that we have got to pay is too extreme. He is calling us to something that is going to look like hatred of your wife, of your children, something like, let me, let me make it very clear. He is calling us to something that looks like hatred. It's not hatred. He said, I'm calling you to get on the cross, which means a willingness to die in a excruciating pain, a very painful death.
Luke chapter 14, verse 33. So likewise, whosoever ye be of you that forsake, that forsake not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. He has refused it. So what do we understand now? Any one of you who does not renounce all he has, he cannot be my disciple. Remember that young rich uh, man, young, the, the young rich man came to the Lord and said, sir, what can I do to inherit the kingdom of God? He said the Ten Commandments. That young man, I always caught him. It was something very significant. He stood before the Holy God and he laughed. He said, Ten Commandments. He laughed. The Lord Jesus Christ looked at him. He said, Ten Commandments. He said, Yes. He looked at him. The Bible, the other Bible vision said, He laughed him, meaning he was telling the truth. He laughed him. The Lord looked at him. Come on. He said, Ten Commandments. Oh, yes. He stood before the Lord Jesus Christ and said, Ten Commandments challenged him. He looked at him. See, impressive. Things that the Pharisees could not do. That is what this young man was not a Christian. He said, Lord, that one, I don't worry about that one. And he said, Now, because you are rich, I want you to go and sell everything that you have. Give it to the poor, then come and follow me. That's when he said, Ah, uh -uh. I went to school alone now. I ran my business alone. Why would I give to everybody? Well, people were, people were sleeping when I was working. He could not pay that. That willingness was not there. So if you cannot renounce all you have, then you cannot be his disciple. You must renounce everything that you have to be his disciple. You must be ready at any time to let go of everything for the Lord's sake. There are things as a servant of God that I, I was telling my family one time. I said, if the Lord, I'm not praying, but I'm not going to get into specifics. To say, if the Lord were to ask any one of us here, let's generalize it. If God was going to ask your husband, to stop working and say, oh, you will be working for me. How many you, how many of you as wives, sisters, mothers, who say, ah, have you lost it? How will you be surviving? How will you be paying the rent? We'll hear all those things because everybody's beginning to count the cost already. Everybody begin to count the cost. It's okay, you want to save the Lord. But you are living in a physical house that is using electricity. You are paying for NEPA. You are paying for water. You are paying if you are for the basement. You are paying for the car. You are not going to say, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I pray that when I go down to my car, it will be having full tank. You say, Amen. You go to the car, you see everything is full tank. God does not do such miracles, such, such uh, mythical things because he respects the sphere, our, um, our sphere, our sphere is human beings. That's why God does not print money to come and give me. He may use somebody that he has blessed to come and do the blessing. Will you count that cost and say, yes, my husband is okay, we'll manage. I don't think many can get that far. So how do you count the costs in advance when you don't know what that cost will be? It's still the same thing that we're talking about. Why am I trying to emphasize about this issue of count the costs? How do you count something that you don't know? The Bible, if the Bible or uh, Proverbs, just the, not Proverbs, the idiomatic saying said, count, the, don't, do not count the chickens before they hatch, because you don't know how many of them will become baby chickens. Give every, everything that you have, your possessions, relationships, all of life, give them up. That's what it is to say, I'm calling you to that. Give everything up. Let go of everything. That is the expectation the Lord Jesus Christ is calling us for. 
we have to presume that there's no price too high to pay for our salvation. Remember, he went to the cross for that salvation. He bought you with a precious blood, Christ. What other price too high can you pay for him for the work that he did for us? So I've got said, news, brethren, the Lord Jesus Christ is not ready to compromise or to negotiate and no calculations whatsoever. He is not ready one to compromise, he's not ready two to negotiate. He told Enoch, walk with me. Enoch walked with him for, th for 300 years and he was taken. Abraham walked with me. So you cannot come and start wanting to change say, God, just change now. Uh -uh. Why are you too harsh? He is saying, I'm not willing to lower the standard for this wicked, foolish generation. Learned but foolish generation. So if you are coming with claims to negotiate, then you are not ready. You cannot come to him that way. So, okay, if I come and save you, are you going to give me a house to live in? Are you going to give me a, 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 a car to drive? Are you going to give like 50,000 euros in my account? But if I want anything, you know? If you come with such claims, you are not ready. You are just not ready. Neither are you going to sign up for 95% of what you want. Oh yes, the Lord Jesus Christ will reject everything that you think you are. All of what you think you are. Of that 95% but God, and he said all or nothing. You know, our Lord is, I do not want to use, <laughs> he's a, he works on the principles, he does not change. He doesn't change. In the secular world, you said, oh, that is stubborn. A person does not move on their position. That's what he said. If you are coming with 98, 99, take it. I don't need it. What is the cost? Luke chapter 14. We'll be playing much in this book of Luke because that's where that counts the cost. It says, Luke 14, verse 14. And thou shalt be blessed for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed in the resurrection of the just. Resurrection, the first Corinthians chapter 15, 51, 50, 51 to 54, in the twinkling of an eye, will be transformed. When the angel blows up the trumpet, the dead in Christ will rise, and then we that are alive will then be caught up. That's a rapture, because the term rapture in the Bible is not written as rapture. That's taken out. There's a Greek word. So there's no cost that you can pay in following him. That won't be made up a thousandfold in the resurrection. That is the message the Lord is giving us today. There is no cost that you can pay me in following me, the Lord Jesus Christ. That will not be paid a thousandfold. Follow me to the book of um, Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. Yeah, doubtless, I count all things but loss, the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but down, that I may win Christ. I counted everything as a loss. I count it as manure, that I may win him. This is Apostle Paul, he's boasting in Christ now. I count all things but loss, the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. I did not know. There, there was one, they used, to, they used to call him Professor Kwambola Mbola. He met the Lord Jesus Christ in the 50s. He was converted directly by the Lord Jesus Christ. He was in Satanism. Even the devil feared him because he was much more wicked than the devil himself. He said something. He said, the, the name of the Lord is sweet. It's sweet in Finnish. In ordinary language, all the presumed costs and all the imagined losses cannot be compared to the greater treasure that one can find in the Lord Jesus. You cannot compare.
pay. It's like the pain of going to school. When you get a good job, you said, oh, I was reading to call up to 2 a.m., 4 a.m., cracking my head. Now, well, how much can you compete? Now you can look after your family. You can do the things that we are supposed to do and live a decent place. Counting the cost. Do what the Lord tells you to do. This is a practical definition of a disciple of Christ. That's what it means. If uh, any one of you have played some sports, especially karate, where you become a disciple, when you're learning from a senpai, a master, anything he says, run or go and take me water, do it. Don't ask. So that readiness, that readiness to be willing to do what the master tells you. I want to put it at a level which we can comprehend. Remember the Great Commission. Go where Jesus Christ tells you to go. Abraham, I want you to go. Come from this land and go to, uh, to the other land I'm going to tell you to go. He left. So the commandments of the Lord applies to all areas of our life. Who you want to engage, who you want to toast. <laughs> so let me use the, the Nigerian term. Who you want to toast, God or marry. Which career to choose, which company to work for, how you plan your day. Your, your day, the way, yesterday today is Sunday. How do you plan it? He said, let me plan it for you. Today, he has got a lot of resistance from all of us. Uh -uh. Is it not my day now? He said, blessed is the day for the Lord has made it. Let me rejoice now in this day. Uh -uh. What do you want again, Lord? He has blessed the day and let me enjoy it. He said, no, not enjoying according to your definition. It's quite interesting how the Lord works these things. So people come, especially caught, yo, know, this my girlfriend, I, I thought she was good. But this one, I thought, when you would, that's why a supervised courtship is very important, especially if you're in it. If you want to marry the proper way, people pray, there's a marriage and counseling committee, and people sit. All the things that I expected, it goes beyond, ah, I love you, this, this. There are times when things will go south. Not probably because the two of you, because when you both marry, you marry into the families you are going to, only the opposite of each other. I married into my wife's family, but she married also into my family. That every burden that is coming from this side or from this side, we must be able to take it. It can bring a strain, stress in the marriage. So that kind of stress, that's where people said, ah, I did not know it was going to be like this. That's why God said, come, let me show you your pattern. Let me show you where you're supposed to, how you're supposed to live. At times, it's not like that. This is one area, one gray zone in the church today. It's a gray zone. The tears that are being shed can fill the ocean. What he means by all is that there's the absolute or authority, absolute authority to tell you what to do and where to go as well. I don't want you to go to work today. Okay, so, call, I'm not coming to work today. Okay, you sit, then you say, now go to this, go to this place. You wait upon him to tell you where to go. The Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 8, Matthew chapter 8, from verse 18, the Lord Jesus Christ saw multitudes about him. He gave a commandment to go unto the other side of the lake. Cross over. There, are, there were people on one, there were people on one side of the lake, and the Lord gave them orders to cross the other side. Why do you think the Lord Jesus Christ gave such an order? I 
I pray for them. I pray not for the world. Where was the Lord Jesus Christ? But for them which thou hast given me, they are mine. And all that are mine are thine. And thine are mine. And I'm glorified in them. So the Lord is not looking for the multitude who simply follows him around. No. If you love me, he said, you, you know, the Lord was a great, um, I say we call him the great teacher, the great prophet, the great apostle, the great evangelist. He is everything, everything. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So he's looking for disciples, he's going to follow his commandments. Disciples who are going to follow his commandments. Many are in, are in churches today because of miracles or troubling issues of life. The crowd that followed the Lord Jesus Christ because of miracles, some were there because of food. Remember the first wedding in Cana, where you met that miracle about that foolish boy that I always talk about. The one whose wedding was the most disorganized in the history. That's why the Bible put it in there. You are the most undeserving sinner when you came to the Lord. There are Muslims, there are Buddha, there are people outside the Christian faith who live a better, honorable life. I want to relate that one to that foolish guy. After that wedding was performed, even the guest of honor said, what? This is the sweetest wine that I've ever drank. What did the man do? After two weeks, he went, he put, in, he put on a website, billboard. If you want to have an organized, uh, uh, an organized, a good wedding, come to me. He started giving notes on the people of, about things that he never knew how to organize himself. What am I simply trying to say? I'm simply trying to say, God is blessed. Now you don't mention you have removed his name there. So, oh, me. Oh, I'm too much. Huh? I'm too much. Just like this foolish guy, he had the most disorganized wedding. He was just living from hand to mouth. The Lord made a miracle. Food was everywhere. He started giving notes, just like King Hezekiah. When people came to see him, even after the sun was removed, was taken back 10 degrees. He never did. He said, no, no, come, let me show you. There were people with iPhones, iPhone 13, running, taking pictures. Say, come, this is where I put my gold. These are my vaults. This is where the, the key to the search here. People said, People were asking questions, the spies. Did, did you take that shot? I was blocked, somebody was blocking me, so I did, I did. They could. People were taking notes. Why God let them to go into Babylon? Hmm. They went into, <laughs> into bondage. You see how foolish we can be. God has blessed you. God has taken your life. You have given 15 extra years to live. Instead of saying there is a God in Israel, who heals people. There is a God who listens to prayer. There's a God who cannot change. That's what God was expecting him to do. He said, no, me, I'm too much. And when the prophet came, prophet Isaiah, he said, what have you done? He said, I showed them everything, everything. Mm, everything said yes for that. This is what is going to happen. Say, thank God it's not in my time. It is when I'm gone. Just imagine the wickedness. Your children will be eunuch. I'm not going to, no, but this could, your generation will finish on this one. He said, no, no, I don't care. As long as he's not catching me. So people were following the Lord Jesus Christ because of food. Because you can see the very same thing today. Many are in the church. Ah, pastor. We wanted to pay my rent. With this. The moment they see you, it's about money. One thing or the other. Nobody said, God, I want you to, I, can, you, can you teach me? I want to be a solid Christian. No. Money. 
So what are you coming to Christ for? That's why we've got pseudo Christians, a bunch of people pretending to be Christians, when they are in fact looking at what the Lord can do for them. They care less about what us. That, that is for you and me. It's the same thing for you and me. That's why they're called pseudo Christians. They look like Christians, but nothing like fake. Let me say, when you see something that is fake, it looks like James chapter 1, verse 11. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat. Hallelujah. But it, where with the grass flower, there of falleth, and the grace passion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. When real challenge comes, brethren, especially those that come in Christianity, they are not taught about these things. That when challenges come, they run away, they backslide. Uh -uh. Before said, I prayed for somebody, they got healed. I did this, it went like this. Now they think they have arrived. This is why it is very important to learn in great humility. Many today are back in the world again because of that. They did not know. They went. God said, Ah, the sun will rise no soon again. Goes down. Flowers that you are seeing like this, they are gone. So it's also the rich man. There's something that I said, uh, the Bible said the love of money is the cause, the root cause of evil. But being broke is also not holy. Sin, uh, poverty itself becomes a sin. It becomes a sin. Many people are selling their families. We once saw a movie a few years ago, eight or nine years ago, where one popular Nigerian actor, when he went out to this uh, brotherhood, he said, are you willing to make the sacrifice? He said, yes. Can you sacrifice your mother? Say, not only my mother, my father, my brother, and everybody else, give them up. Poverty. We were laughing at him. He said, no, I waste no time. So that's why poverty becomes a sin. We can live in the abundance of what Christ provides for us. So when real challenges comes after a few victories, run away. They are ready to sign up without knowing about the difficulties ahead. Mark chapter four, verse six. Mark chapter four, verse six. But when the sun was up, it was because it had no root, it withered away. When you read from Mark chapter 4, the story about the rain. <coughs> this plants, that when the sun heats, it's up. Because there's no root. You don't, you don't have a um, solid foundation in the word of God. I think Psalms 119 verse 30. When we come to Christianity, we quickly read it. Let us quickly read it and see what the Bible says. The times it's important in, we are not in a class, the Bible. If it was not CHMI, I would have taken questions. But if I'm ministering elsewhere, I take questions from the book. It says here, Mark chapter four. Let me start from verse three. I can behold, they, they, they went out a sword so. And it came to pass as he saw some fell by the wayside, the fowls of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on the stony ground where it did not much earth and immediately sprang up because it no depth in them. But when the sun was up, it was scorched because it was no root, it withered away. This is what the Lord is saying. If you are not solid as a Christian, let me read this one now. The Psalms 130, 119 verse 30. I think, you know, the Bible says, they usually come and preaching. 
So let me see what I'm right. Psalms 119, is it 130? Let me check. Yeah, sorry. Psalms 119, 130. Praise the Lord. The entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Simple is a polite word for foolish people. That's what the Bible was trying to do. They do not want to be seen like insulting people. Simple means foolish. It gives you, because when you come, we are coming from the world, we are foolish. So we want to be wise. That's why when you come, when you come as a wise person, you cannot learn before Christ. Come as a foolish someone. Then you, are, you can learn. God, give me the wisdom. Give me the favor. Give me the, uh, the wisdom like you gave Daniel. I think Daniel chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. So when we come to Christianity, brethren, the Lord Jesus Christ is ask, asking us to cross over to the other side. He is calling us to come to the other side, to walk by his side, to take his side against the world side. Are we standing with the Lord against the whole world? Say, yes, that's what he's calling us for. That's what he's calling out for. Second Corinthians chapter 6. Wherefore, come out from among them and be here separate, said the Lord. Come out from among them and be here separate. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. We hear the world talk about being right, being on the right or wrong side of the city. Honestly, what we need or really need is to walk with him and to be on the right side of Jesus. Which side are you, my brother? Which side are you, my sister? Are you on the side of the world? Are you on the side of the Lord Jesus? He hath my commandments and keepeth them. He is that love me. I love that statement, you know. <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ was somebody he used to. His message is always simple. The person who's got my commandments and keep them is the one that loves me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. And I will love him. And I will manifest myself to him. This is the Bible. He that has got my commandment, now that you have got commandments, now that we have been teaching about this thing, are you keeping them? If you are not keeping them, you hate him. If you are keeping them, you love him. If you love him, he said, the Father is going to love you. It's one of those things that I always, some of the Bible verses that I always tell the people who talk about Trinity. They don't understand the concept of Trinity. They say there's nothing like Trinity. This is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking here. John chapter 14, verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he is the one that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. We see two people already, and you're asking the Holy Spirit, I'm going to send another wonderful counselor. And Brethren, I really don't know where people are learning from. So when you see a whole pastor, presumed pastor of God, when you say pastor, I mean evangelists, teachers, servants of God. Like when you talk about Coca-Cola. I say, you want Coca-Cola? I say, yes. I say, which one? Fanta. That's what you use. It's a blanket, it's a blanket term. Servants of God. Matthew chapter 8. One man came, a scribe, came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee which river where to go. Then another one again, he came just two verses down the line. He said, Lord, suffer me to go in the day. Remember, that's what Jesus Christ said, let the dead go and bury themselves. Hmm? Your father has died. According to, um, I do not want to get into theology, it's one that has distorted the doctrine of Christ. 
when as the first son, when your father is old through old age, you must wait until he dies, bury him, then you can. This is what you say, suffer me to go and be with my father. He said, no, if he dies, leave him to go there. There are certain things that do not come exactly the way that it should be, because that's why four of them, Luke, Mark, John, and Matthew brought these um, books. So the first scribe, the first scribe impulsively told the Lord Jesus Christ, you will follow him wherever he goes. The second one wants to follow, but he needs to take care of some business. I've got some business, sir. You know, I'm a businessman. He was busy on WhatsApp. Say, sir, see, I want an appointment. This is an email that came. Tomorrow there's a meeting. It's personal. You see, people, it has not changed. I'm just putting it to today so that you can relate with what you do. Because people are on the cell phone, people are receiving WhatsApp, emails, all those things. So we know these things. So we've got to relate with the particular time that we are living. So the first one described was zealous and wanted to follow. The second one was doubtful and yet cold feet. Yet cold feet. It sounds all too familiar, right? Yes. It appears there are two situations on the ground here. Two problems are really one in the same. None of them is willing to put Christ first. That is the bottom line. None of them. He said to me, I want to do this. That I'll say, let me suffer me to go and bury my father. He said, no, it doesn't work like that. If you are going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, you have got to put him first. Luke chapter 14. We're coming back to Luke chapter to look again. Look, this is the doctor that wrote the book of Acts, but it's not important. Luke chapter 14, verse 18. And they all with one consent began to make. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, sir. I need to go and see. My company bought me a land, so I want to build. I want to see everything is okay. So can you excuse me, sir? The Lord Jesus Christ said, yeah, quite excuse. Go. That's what you want. He will not stop you from going. These are the excuses that we do if we give every day in our Christian life. We are giving excuses. Even the Lord Jesus Christ said, the fox has holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to go. Today he said. Let the dead bury their dead. The answer to the first disciple teaches us to put Christ before personal comfort. Personal come. The answer to the second will be the will be disciple now teaches us to put Christ before personal relationship. Ah, my father, ah, my this. They said, Do you see personal comfort and personal relationship? Comes down to the same thing at the end of the day. Put Christ before personal comfort. The, fair, the, the first scribe, that was the man, was a very respected teacher of law in the community. He was a respected servant of um, teacher of law. To be a teacher of law meant that he spent a lot of time, a lot of time studying God's word, and he and he, he people and ah, this one you know, you want to know anything about God, go to this one, they know the Bible. Watch the Lord Jesus Christ respectfully. He said, Rab, I greet you with enthusiasm. Sir, I greet you. I will follow you wherever you go. When you see it at face value like this, oh, it's very commendable. So this one was very correct. Say, Rab, I I'll follow you wherever you go. This brother pledged to follow the Lord Jesus Christ without counting the cost. Very similar to what Apostle Peter said. Even if everyone else falls, I will never fall. Apostle Peter was very overconfident. He was very overconfident. 
the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to sift you, that he may sift you as wheat. That's when the Lord Jesus Christ said to Apostle Peter, if thou, when thou art become a Christian, help your brothers. He was told to help his brothers. Why? Because it's very important. Apostle Peter was very overconfident. So was this teacher of the law. So wherever you go, me, I'll go with you anyway, said Peter. Remember, before he was told, the devil wants to see if you said yes. The Lord told him, said, do you see this SMS? Said, yeah. You wrote the SMS, I saw it. Say, he said, Peter, Peter, oh God, what is it? He said, me, wherever you want to go, I said, the devil wants to sift you. But when thou art become a Christian, when thou art converted, strengthen your brethren. The Lord did absolute authority as shown by the miracles that he performed. He had the authority to tell us what to do, where to go. So we need to count the cost of following him. And that was this disciple's mistake. How many of us are talking first before thinking? There is a switch be, be, um, connecting the brain and the mouth. Most of us, we run mouth too much without counting the cost. Yes, sir, I'll do it, me, I'll do it. I know myself now. Uh, you think you can be wiser than the devil? The man used wherever he used to switch talk. Just like John, uh, the Nicodemus in the book of John chapter 3. He said, Rabbi, you are a great rabbi. He came in the middle of the night. He said, Verily, verily, I tell you the truth, Nicodemus. If you want to enter the kingdom of God, he said, You could not come in the middle of the night to disturb me from sleeping now, to come and compliment me. You see me during the day. He came. He wanted to sweet talk, he wanted to impress him, say, Wherever you go, me, I'll follow you. But the Lord now, see, see, just, just to see how the Lord, you know, the, the, the way he does this, the way he does, he, he does these things is just very simple. Instead of saluting his courage and wish to follow him wherever he want to go, the Lord steps back a bit and discourages him. He said, ah, you want to follow? He asked him something. He gave him a dose about reality. He to follow him. He said, will you pick that cross and follow me? He said, since you want to follow me, okay, I'm coming up on your offer now. I will take you up on your offer. He gives, it was a dose of reality. The Lord was ultimately going to the cross. Remember, he was, on the, he was going to the cross now, the crucifixion. So was this man really willing to follow the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you willing to follow him to the cross, brethren? My beloved sister, are you willing to follow him to the cross? Salvation is free, but it's very costly. Many are crying today. Remember, there was a time when I said, people say, God, me, make me, uh, use me, do this. God, make me whole, take away this. There are some prayers that you don't you say, God, let me be able to hold at every stage you put me through in my life. If you're a fighting person, the Lord is going to bring you. That character will come out now. You cannot hide it for long. It's like stupidity. Stupidity is like a, when you get gray hairs now, how long are you going to dye the hair? It's not, is it not now that people are dying the hair? But you still cannot hide the, um, this, I don't know what they call them when people are aged on the face. I don't know the English, I forgot it. So one needs to be careful. The Lord Jesus Christ did not bring the cross here. That's the point to his general homelessness, where he said, the son of man do not have. He said, the birds have holes, the foxes have bed, nests, but the son of man has no way to lay his head. Comfort. If you are willing to put Christ before personal comfort, you are, are, you, you are just ready to follow him all the way to the cross. That's why the Lord said, when the son hit the plant withered because it had no root. It just ate like that. The Lord Jesus Christ 
they said that when the teacher of the law saw the Lord Jesus Christ, miracles, the way that he was doing his things, they said, this is exciting. I'll follow this man wherever he goes. There is a cost in following him. The Lord is not looking for multitudes to follow him around. He is looking for disciples who will follow his commandments and ultimately follow him to the cross. The Lord Jesus Christ is a king. He's not a celebrity. All those pulpit, celebrity pulpit um, preachers you are seeing now, they are making a mockery of the sac ultimate sacrifice which the Lord Jesus Christ did. Because God is a spirit. Hey, that worship, you must worship him in spirit and in truth. You cannot worship him anyhow now. If in Daniel saw the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was seeing in a vision, Daniel chapter 7, he said, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, rapture. He came, came to the ancient of days. He was given dominion and glory. All the nations, languages, everything. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion. We shall not. His kingdom. That we shall not be destroyed. So as Christians, they are being told now. That's why I say, Daniel, we you close this thing. It's not for now. It's for a time yet to be appointed. Daniel fell down. He was sick for several days. He could not stand, he needed strength. All the virtue that was in him left him. Night vision, so one like son of man. Remember King Nebuchadnezzar, he said one like son of man. We saw the Lord Jesus as walking in majesty. The son of man is the divine nature of Christ who received all authority. It's a divine nature. The Lord Jesus Christ is God. He just used son because he must Say, okay, I'm coming from my father. But remember, he is God who is to be worshipped by nations. And this kingdom will not be destroyed forever. Sometimes it seems that we want the words of Christian discipleship without making any sacrifices. Initially, this ministry was a big, huge personal ambition. I said, I don't follow. Say people, ah, if you go, I will do this. I will not do anything. I will not do anything. I gave back the ministry. The day that he gave me, I gave it back to him. Don't let your ministry die in my hands. It's your ministry. It's your ministry, not my ministry. So if it dies, it's for his own name, not for my name's sake. I don't have a church. I do not die for anybody. I make it very clear. So many today are staying in churches, in congregations, because our oh, pastor is nice. It's not about being my niceness. Nice, die today, perish, go to hell, you are condemned forever. Never had the truth that makes you to sit back and say, oh God. So if I die today, I'm a pure, the first candidate for hell. This is what I can tell you, brethren. If you don't take the truth, to God be the glory. It doesn't work that way. You want the rewards of Christian discipleship without making any sacrifices. No, it does not work that way. Neither in life does it work that way. You first work, then you get your salary. It's always sacrifices first. So the reply of the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, why do you want to follow me? Is it the miracles? Is it the healings? Are you expecting a new life of ease and comfort? If you are going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, you must put Christ first, which means Christ before personal comfort. Jesus Christ put you before his comfort. When you went to the cross, remember the Bible says, he made the moon you not seem to be kind, sin on our behalf, even the last teaching that I did. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. He put you before your personal comfort, before his own personal comfort. I'm going for these people because I love them. Other one, let me go and bury my dead son. Let the, the dead bury them, themselves. And like the, this teacher of the law, the man, this man seems to be willing to leave home and family for the Lord. But there is a problem. 
he was willing to do this, but not now, later. Me, I'm going to serve Lord when I'm 55. Who told you are going to be 55? You may die next week, what happens? If the first man was too quick to follow the Lord, the second one was too slow. He acknowledged, say, Lord, Lord, can I go and bury my father? Putting anything other than Jesus Christ first in his life, he was putting a personal relationship before Christ. There was a couple, I'm not sure which country, uh, if their child died. Their son died the morning the pastor was coming to church. The child is dead. Says, leave, leave, leave everything the way that it is. The woman was crying, said, just follow me quietly. Don't do anything, no sin, nothing. They left the maid at home. Said, okay. He went in, did his powerful preaching, finish. What did God do? He put his comfort. He said, whatever it is, I put you first. They saw when he was about to finish his ministering, he saw the maid coming with the child that was dead. God said, if you take care of my own, I'll take care of your own. At times, it seems like a reasonable thing. So it was an important duty, a Jew in biblical terms, to bury their father, especially the first. This would have included funeral arrangements, actual burial, and additional time for mourning, and settle the father's case if he had credit, if somebody was owing him to follow up all those things. Taking care of these matters took precedence over reciting your daily prayers and the other important. Even a priest was allowed to become ceremonially unclean in order to bury his father or a close relative. And the of Leviticus, we can see that in the book of Leviticus. So the Bible says, you shall have no other gods before me. Remember, it's one of the, the very first commandments in the book of Exodus chapter um, 20 from verse 3, where the Ten Commandments are. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of Man. He is divine. He is God. So he must come first. We don't call Jesus Lord and then put your agenda first before his. It's like a twig now. My boss comes, says, oh, I've seen something. Oh, please. He always comes first. I want to give us practical examples. My boss comes at three. I forgot this one. We need it tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, please. Said this. I'll stay until five. It's okay. He have put him first. You see, because here there is money. This is what he's saying now. If you can put this mere mortal here, what about me? We have no freedoms to make our own rules if we are to be useful. This is exactly what we do in our workplaces. And our employers are always correct. Many people are treated as the most stupidest people at work. No matter how intelligent they are, they are treated as the most foolish people. They accept it. They get their rights when they get home. If the Lord is ultimate authority, then we must follow his commandments without any condition. Disobedience is a sin, it must be repented of. Christ comes first even before personal or family relationships. Those in Islamic countries know this and understand this too well. They put before anything, they know said, ah, our Allah come first. In the modern day of now, because we have what religious freedoms, many who come to Christ out of Islam know that they are giving up their families for Christ. They are hated forever, they are disowned. You see how the, 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 the Muslims become better Christians. Now, me, I'm going to see my mother. Me, I'm going, what are you going to do if you see her? You cancel your administration, you are going to say, yeah, because my mother is sick. Look at a Muslim. Let them die. What, what can I do? Their family rejects them and considers them dead. 
They said, this one is dead to me. I don't want to see you again. I no longer have a daughter. Finish. I don't want to see her again. So she's our daughter. Say, woman, keep quiet. We, if we had four children, we have three. This one died. Following the Lord Jesus Christ is not some kind of a sick talk. There are costs to following the Lord Jesus Christ. We must be willing to follow Christ's commandments. You must be willing to put Christ before your test in your personal life. You must be willing to follow through on your commitment. It's not enough to just say the words. Remember in German, I don't know, uh, in English, I think, let me try to say it in German first. It says, the tongue had kind of broken. This is translated it means the tongue has no bones. I don't know whether it's the equivalent in English. Tongue has no bones. You can just me. I'll follow you, Lord, without counting the cost. It's not saying the words because the words you can say me. I fly. This is not what he's talking about. Fly. Let's see. We must count the cost and follow. The Lord Jesus Christ is worth the cost. He is more than worth the cost that we are crying about. Yes, there is a cost following the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not naive. There is a greater cost not following him. There is a pure hell burning with fire, brethren. There is a fire burning, waiting for anybody who does not walk with him, who refuses to follow him. Hell is real. Hell is waiting for any soul that, is, that dies without Christ. The tragedy in life is not dying, but dying without Christ. Jesus is worth the cost. Jesus is worth everything you have. If you lose Jesus, you lose everything. If you gain Jesus, you have lost nothing. If you gain Jesus, you have lost nothing at all. So do not worry about what are people going to say? What are people going to do this? People are going to talk. Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Are you a disciple of Christ? Are you counting the cost? I do not want somebody to say, I've been 10 years in CHMI. I have been this, I have been that. May the Lord bless us. May the Lord take this message to heart. I hand over back to you, my sister.